Greetings. This is uh, Dr. Abraham Weisfeld speaking here from uh, Montreal, Quebec. And I'm doing uh, continuing the reading of the uh, work, the study, the book, <laughs> published by Cambridge University Press by Lars Fischer, entitled The Socialist Response to Antisemitism in the German Imperial State during the time of the uh, Second International. So this is a critique of the, the classical Marxists and their position on antisemitism and their position on antisemitism. <clears throat> okay, now we'll go to Shen. This reading is a defining character of both Marxism and Bundism. So this defines <clears throat> why there was a split between the the Jewish Bund and the uh, and the Marxists. And uh, this is a uh, a critique of not only the uh, Bolshevik Marxists, but also the, the Menshevik Marxists. And we're starting with the Menshevik Marxists here in the Second International. And uh, unfortunately, the Third International, the communists, uh, maintained the, uh, a similar position on anti-Semitism as was the case in the Second International and the, amongst the, Marx, the Marxist Mensheviks. Okay, let's go for it now. Yeah, we're starting on page 164. To be sure, in general terms, it is probably fair to say that one needs to know the ins and outs. Okay, here it is. Here's the microphone now. One, to be sure, in general terms, it is probably fair to say that one needs to know the ins and the outs of the realities on the ground to organize political activity in a particular locality. On the other hand, a priori, there is nothing to say that, is, that an insider is necessarily a more acute analyst than an outsider. Intimate involvement can generate profound insight. It can also blur one's vision. Sometimes it takes an outsider to put his or her finger on something all those directly involved can no longer see. Needless to say, though, we need to read the controversy against the more specific background of a cultural and intellectual context pervaded by notions radically privileging ethnic supremacy and belonging, belonging to the need to maintain the integrity of one's ethnic identity. For most people, it would have seemed self-evident that each national group had its own essence and spirit, I'm sure, that would never really be accessible or even genuinely comprehensible to anyone not belonging to that group. Exile, consequently, was a state of affairs defined not so much by choice, i.e. the conscious decision to maintain the locality of one's origin, rather than the locality of one's current residence, as the primary focus of one's aspirations. Exile was ultimately defined by the fact that no, that one would never be able genuinely to come into one's own in any land other than that of one's origin. That's Zionism. Life outside of one's fatherland could never be more than a transitory option and never really took its toll on those cut off from their roots. Well, roots is something you carry with you, you know, like, woe betide those who for some reason were condemned never to return like the Palestinians, in criticizing matters, German, the exiles are not merely out of their depth in the sense that they lack intimate familiar, familiar, familiarity with the empirical reality on the ground. They were also out of their depth in a much more fundamental sense. They were cut off from the spirit required to interpret an empirical that empirical reality correctly. Correctly. Hmm correctly. 
the whole book should be written about what correctly means correctly. Their critique not only lacked imperial empirical grounding, it was in an important sense spiritually inauthentic. Okay. Against the background, the notion that the exiles might have seen the state of affairs in the German territories more critically because the distance allowed them a more detached and objective perspective was obviously inconceivable. Interestingly enough, it would seem that this logic applied in only one direction. Liebknecht treated Germany unjustly because he had developed the habit of doing so while in exile. Marx and Engels were altogether more uncharitable in their analysis of conditions in Germany than LaSalle because they were in exile. Few within the party, on the other hand, were as optimistic about the state of affairs in Imperial Germany as Edward Bernstein. Yet, the fact that he was in exile from 1879 until 1901 does not seem to have rendered his optimism inauthentic in the eyes of those who felt they could discard the pessimism of others who were more critical of Germany's development by blaming it on their time in exile. Okay, what does this footnote say now? Uh, it's about Bernstein. Bernstein, while still living in exile, apparently shared Liebknecht's notion that charity begins at home. To my mind, he wrote on one occasion, rather than joining in the German chauvinist's denunciation of England, the socialist journalist should alert his compatriots to the ways in which conditions abroad are more advanced. Edward Bernstein, Der Kampf der Socialdemokratie in der Revolution der Gesellschaft. Yes. From, translated from Bernstein's Kampf in Socialische Demokratie, uh, Struggle and Social Democracy. Okay, we continue. In any case, the stipulation that charity begins at home was clearly one that Liebknecht did not merely conjure up to rationalize his anti Dreyfusar rant. That's incredible, you know, like Liebknecht, you know, was so un Jewish that he couldn't support a Jewish martyr. Yeah. That's, you know, like, <laughs> that's like assimilation, just go boo. You know, like, okay, integration, you know, like, okay, fine, you know, be Polish and Jewish at the same time. Yeah, man. But to give up? No. Uh, here, let's take a break here. Okay, let's continue here. Share and share, we will. Other words for socialism sharing. Okie dokie. In any case, the stipulation that charity begins at home was clearly one that Liebnik did not merely conjure up to rationalize his anti Dreyfusar rant. The position that he experienced, that he expressed in these articles remains highly problematic all the same. But all this was neither here nor there for Brown's uh, line of argument in Dresden. Brown's uh, reference to Liefnick's articles in the Freckle, in fact, implied no criticism at all. Brown was merely pointing out that those who argued that members of the party had always been wise enough in the past not to collaborate with the anti-socialist publications were wrong. Liebnick, for one, had collaborated with an anti-socialist publication. Nobody had kicked, in, had kicked up that sort of stink about Liebnick's collaboration with Krauss that was now being made about the collaboration of Brown and his associates with Hardin. Brown was utilizing the precedent of Liebnick's articles in the Frankel in his own defense. It would therefore be nonsensical to suggest his remarks were meant as a critique of Liebnick. Brown did, of course, allude to the fact that Liebnick's anti Dreyfusard articles had created problems for the Dreyfusards among the French socialists. 
From the context, it is quite clear, though, that this reference was meant as an indication of the significance of Leif Nix's articles in the Frankel, not as a critique of their content. Not only had Leibniz published material in an anti-socialist publication at all, he had published substantial articles that had an immediate political impact. We certainly have no reason to suspect Brown himself of having been any more sensitive or sophisticated than his peers when it came to anti-Semitism and the Jewish question. Brown was himself of Jewish origin and had apparently refused to convert for the sake of an academic career. His approach was nevertheless entirely in keeping with the stance prevalent amongst his peers. Take, for example, the comments he made in his Archiv für Social Gesellschaftsgebung in Statistik on the electoral success of the anti Semites in 1893. That anti Semitism represents a strong social trend, he stated, is as undeniable as it is the fact that within it, next to the attack on Jewry, a more generally radical anti-capitalist tendency is trying to assert itself with ever greater clarity and self-awareness. Ever greater clarity? Yeah, that's why they're anti-Semitic? Oh yeah, wow. <laughs> and he's supposed to be Jewish, you know, like, that's it draws closer to social democracy in the Reichsangsler von Caprivi is completely justified in calling it the harbinger of social democracy, the law of social gravitation, <laughs> from anti-Semitism to socialism. Oh yeah, well, good luck, really. And this would eventually make the anti-Semitic movement merge into the stronger, more powerful social democratic movement. But although it was hard to say how long exactly that might take. Yeah, it's like you know the libertarians who think that the Trump movement. Trumpist movement is going to lead to something more socialistic. Yeah, good luck. Okay, we continue. Uh, just a moment. Petite gorge d'eau. Avec un peu de citron. Okay, okay, I'll speak Yiddish. This will last again. Okay, now we continue. Brown's, Brown's mention of Leifnitz's collaboration with Krauss drew three responses. First came from Kautsky. Speaking immediately after Brown, he conceded that, quote, it is indeed true that Leifnitz wrote for the Fracke, unquote. He then inverted the sense of Brown's remark. I agree with Brown, he claimed, that Leifnitz made a mistake in doing so. I believe, however, that Brown would do well to imitate the great things Leibniz achieved and his revolutionary fervor rather than an occasional gaffe on his part. From the floor. Bravo. Okay. I can only think of one explanation for Leibniz's gaffe, Kautsky added, namely that the Frankel is published in Vienna and Leibniz was unfamiliar, unfamiliar with the conditions there. I doubt it. The second response came in the form of a personal statement by Victor Adler. Well, maybe uh, an ancestor of uh, Alfred Adler, the psychoanalyst who developed the uh, theory of the neurotic complex. Mm -hmm. Very important to socialist revolution, not appreciated by the socialists either, who have not realized that they need to make a psychological as well as a Economic, political, and cultural revolution. For, forefront revolution. Yeah. Okay, we continue. Okay, 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 okay. Victor Adler. He then apologized for having to do so in the particular instance. As leader of the Austrian party, he was the only guest at the Congress who would not ordinarily have intervened. Oh, yeah. Therefore, apologized for having to do so in this particular instance. It was true. Adler stated that Liebknecht did indeed publish a series of articles in the Frankel that we found disagreeable. I owe it to Liebknecht, though, to diminish the force of the accusation little against him. Austrian, Austrian party members, too, had, regrettably, published articles in the Frankel under their full name, and Liebknecht could therefore assume that we took no exception to this periodical. Hmm. I doubt it. 
In fact, both Kautsky and Adler cared in their attempts to defend Liebknecht. The third response to Brown's, Brown's uh, mention of Liebknecht's anti Trefusard articles came in the form of a letter that Karl Kautz Kraus wrote to the Party Congress on the 18th of September. Just a minute here. So if Liebknecht is writing these anti uh, Dreyfus, uh, anti Dreyfusard articles, no wonder they wouldn't get published in the Social Democratic Press. You have to go to the right wing press to express his anti-Semitism. Incredible. How far can this go? Okay, we continue. And then he clarified that not a single Austrian social democrat wrote for the Frankel under, the, under his name prior to Liebnik. That Liebnik should have thought it unobjectionable to collaborate with the Frankel because other socialists had done so before him was therefore impossible. Quote, the truth is, quite to the contrary, that Liebknecht knew the opposite to be true, unquote, Klaus claimed. Quote, and honored the Frankel with his collaboration never, nonetheless, unquote. By implication, Kautsky's contention, quote, that Liebknecht would not have written for the Frankel had he known it was equally incorrect. Cross was to all intents and purposes entirely right. Incidentally, quote unquote, Liebknecht had written to Krauss on the 8th of November, 1899, saying, quote, I made careful inquiries before writing for you, and even opponents told me nothing that would tarnish your honor, unquote. Okay, that settles the matter. Thus, all three responses precipitated by Brown's reference to Liebknecht's anti dreyfus Articles contradict each other in important respects, yet they also have something very fundamental in common. Neither Kautsky nor Adler nor Krauss considered for a moment the possibility that Brown might have been interested in the, in the stance regarding anti-Semitism and the Jews that Liebknecht had expressed in his articles in the Freckle. Oh yes, they forgot about anti-Semitism there, yeah. Okay, let's continue. Among the, okay, just a moment. And uh, those, Okay. Among the articles from the Zukunft that people cited in Dresden as evidence for its malicious and spiteful attitude towards the party. Oh. was Hardin's editorial, the Rotten Prima Donnen. Whoa. The Red Prima Donnas. Whoa. It had commented on the fact that the debate on the Semitism initially planned for the Party Congress of 1892 in Berlin had been put off until the following year. As Babel reminded the delegates Hardin had claimed that this decision was down to the fact that anti-Semitism was, quote, becoming more and more prevalent in the party. Wow. According to Hardin, this was in fact generally acknowledged, quote, not, of course, officially, but in private conversations, unquote. Here is Hardin's account. One motion also addressed the issue of anti-Semitism, which was supposed to be dealt with in the speech by Babel in a subsequent discussion. Anticism was made such rapid progress among the social democrats that one seriously had to fear one might encounter covert or explicit Alvart style utterances, Alvartarian in the debate. Hence, the most interesting item of the agenda was carefully, circum, carefully circumvented. The most interesting item, most important, of course, officially, of course, this is denied with the most emphatic determination. Of, in private conversations, however, even the most enthusiastic comrades admit it with a shrug of their shoulders. Oh, a shrug, just like Pierre Trudeau. Oh, I get it. Yeah. Okay. What did Babel have to say about these contentions? Quote, we can already see here, he explained, the way in which Maximilian Witkowski hardened was privy 
to private conversations among comrades. It is one of the saddest things that have transpired in the party that at, at this at that time on certain evenings in the week, usually Saturday night, a number of prominent comrades, I too was occasionally among them, came together for a drink. A mass of bourgeois writers from various papers would gradually come along and party issues were discussed then and there in the presence of opponents with a recklessness that disgusted me and led me to avoid the gatherings. Yeah, it's like, you know, like putting up uh, internal critiques on YouTube, I guess. Yeah. Okay. This is certainly no denial of Hardin's claim. In fact, Babel's statement is not actually a critique of Hardin at all. This is a critique of those within the party who gave Hardin access to certain forms of information. What troubled Babel was not the content of the information obtained by Hardin, but the way in which he obtained it. What is more, this critique not only does not imply a denial of Hardin's claim regarding the prevalence of anti-Semitism within the party, it in fact confirms it unless Babel's formulation that his comrades had recklessly discussed party of issues in the presence of bourgeois journalists was meant to imply that they had brought false rumors into the circulation, which certainly makes no sense. Yeah. Not even Hardin's claim that social democracy had been forced to postpone the debate on anti-Semitism by year because of the anti-Semitism prevalent in its own rows merited a serious discussion then. It too was deemed relevant only insofar as it demonstrated an instance in which leading social democrats had gone too far in their collaboration with the non-socialist press and harmed the party in the progress, in the process. In and of itself, this demonstration, in fact, did more to confirm than dispel Arden's claim. Okay. I'm 69. That's enough for today. And thanking you for your attention, especially those who actually want to dig into political theory and find out where the dirt lies so that we don't step into it once again. Thank you for listening. <laughs>